Well, good morning, Expectation Church, and good evening, Expectation Church, for when you're going to join us later tonight at 8 p.m. I'm so glad that you're here, and by here, I mean wherever you're watching this. Uh, I, let's just, I'm tired of this. Uh, I was um, doing a stupid thing, and um, I'll, I'll tell you what the stupid thing I was doing I was reading reviews about myself in the church online. Did you know people review my preaching? (laughs) It's great. Uh, And one of the reviews I read a while, uh, I read said that he needs to stop complaining about COVID. (laughs) You know what? Reviewer, whoever you are, you're right. Uh, I do need to stop complaining about COVID, but I'm, I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of glitching. I'm tired of uh, technical difficulties. I'm tired of preaching to a camera. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I hope it's, it's, it's impacting you, but I like seeing your face and I, I, it's, you know, I'm going to be a little sacrilegious. I like shaking hands with people, not a hugger, not a hugger. Huggers, hu- hugging makes me feel awkward a lot, but I do like shaking people's hands and I like looking in people's eyes and I like getting to know people and getting to meet new people. And that's a lot more difficult to do during this time. So I'm, I'm ready for it to be done. So we, we talked about that a little bit. It's really hard to know um, when we should go forward or how we should go forward, you know, because the guidelines that we get from, you know, the people who are supposed to know are consistently changing. That seems, seems to be the, the only constant that we have is that things are always changing. Um, so we're, we're planning on moving into a... a, a a limited capacity, multiple worship experience setting uh, on July 12th. So I think it's pretty cool that um, we started this this quarantine setting, this virtual plus idea with a communion Sunday. And so we are going to finish this virtual plus endeavor with a communion Sunday, God willing. And that'll happen next Sunday. So that would be July 5th. We're going to have um, communion and it'll be communion in your homes and w- or with your community groups. Um, so make sure that you're prepared for that. Uh, and then the Sunday after that, July 12th, is when we'll move into phase three uh, at our church where we can start to regather and we can start seeing each other again. And I'm, I'm really excited about it. I hope you're excited about it. Um, but there's a lot. And, you know, you look at what's going on in the country, too. And I, I even hate to say this out loud, but you, you never know. Things might change, which is why we, we went with a July 12th date. It kind of hopefully it gives you know, time for this, this, the Commonwealth to move into phase three, which will allow us to move into phase three. So it's just, a, there's so much uncertainty and there's so much, um, you know, debate and conflict out there regarding um, all of this. How should we go forward? What should we do? And, and I, I, it's, it goes well beyond the church. I know it, it's at your own place of business, even in your own homes, maybe. So I understand. Um, and I, I thank you for your willingness to be patient and your willingness to, I know, I, look, I get it. Nobody likes streaming church when it keeps glitching out. And I, I get that. Um, it's just the world that we live in. So where does that land us right now, this morning, this June 28th? It's actually my sister's birthday. Happy, happy birthday, Jen. Um, that's my sister's name, Jen, Jennifer, Jenny. Um, we don't look anything like she's blonde and, and blue eyed, <laughs> so which is cool. Anyway, so happy birthday, Jen. So here we are on my sister's birthday, June twenty eighth. What do we? What is? What is all of this introduction stuff about COVID and and moving forward? What does it have to do with today, Pastor Christian? Well, when I was preparing for this message that I'm going to give today, it's it's not really with our series. It's it's kind of a standalone message, which means it's not part of a series or anything. I just kept feeling compelled and convicted that we need to remind ourselves, we need to go to the scripture, we need to, uh, amidst all of these glitches, amidst all of these regathering, reopening, all of these phase things that are happening, and all of the uncertainty in the, in the economy, and amidst all of the, the stuff going on, should we do this, should we do that, what are we supposed to do? Uh, um, it, you know, you look at Texas right now, and Texas is, is everything was moving forward, and all of a sudden all the cases started going crazy, so now in Texas they're actually going back backwards. You know, is that going to happen here? All of that stuff in the midst of all of that, what are we supposed to do? And I think now is the right time, or at least I I feel God was stirring it in my heart. We need to return and we need to just focus for a minute if we can on the very simple fact that we have a mission. 
And that's the title of the, the, the message today. We have a mission. And that's important. We have to understand that we have a mission as, as a church. We have to understand that we have a mission as believers in Jesus Christ. We have to understand that God has a mission for everybody. So if you're watching this right now and you don't believe in Jesus, maybe you have these, these ideas about Jesus. So when I say you don't believe in Jesus, what do I mean by that? Maybe, maybe you, you think Jesus was a real person and that you know, he was probably a good guy. Um, you know, kind of like a, a, a Gandhi of 2,000 years ago, and, and that's about it. If that's you and you're watching right now, I'm so glad you're here because I believe that God has a mission for you. So we have a mission. And so what we're going to do, and I, I really struggled with this because 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 14 I, the more I got into it and studied it and, and, and wrote notes about it, I mean, that I could have broken that into this, this passage. I could have broken it into a four-part series itself. It would have been pretty easy. But I, I, I'm going to preach the whole thing, and I'm, I'm going to have to go kind of quickly through it. So let's read the text. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 14, and I'm going to read from the New Living Translation this morning. Because I think the New Living does a really good job capturing uh, uh, what's in the original text. This is why I remind you. So the, the, this is why. What is he talking about? This is why. So uh, give you a little bit of context of what's going on in 2 Timothy. Uh, there was a, a, a Christian leader, a Christian missionary uh, who went by the name of Paul. His name was actually, it was Paul and it was also Saul of Tarsus. He was Paul, who was called Saul, who was called Paul. So you have this, this missionary, Paul. And he, he travels around, and he starts churches, and he encourages churches, and he encourages other leaders. I mean, he's just, just that's, that's what he does. He travels around, and he starts and encourages churches. And along the way, he has people that, that travel with him. Timothy is one of these guys that traveled with Paul, and Paul kind of developed a special relationship with Timothy. Paul and Timothy were kind of like the, the Jedi master and the Padawan learner, to pull my nerd card out. They were the, uh, uh, Paul was the, the, the leader, and Timothy was the disciple. Paul was the mentor, and Timothy was, I love this word, the mentee. I don't, actually, I don't like that word at all. It just sounds weird. It sounds like the word mint. So Paul... And Timothy have this relationship. And Paul is talking to Timothy and he's trying to encourage Timothy. He's trying to teach Timothy because Timothy has been left by Paul in the city of Ephesus to grow and to start church and churches. And so the, this is why here Paul is encouraging Timothy and he says, Paul, Timothy, I'm reminded of the faith that you had. It started with your grandmother and with your mother. And I'm at, listen, that faith that, that you have in Jesus Christ, it's because of that faith I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So that spirit of fear and timidity, uh, it's, it's kind of hard. So what, what that actually means is you could also think of it as cowardice. God has not given you a spirit of cowardice, to cower in the corner, to, to step away from. So the reason that, that many people think Timothy needed the encouragement is so... so Paul leaves Ephesus. He leaves Timothy there in Ephesus. Timothy is pastoring this church. He's trying to grow other churches and start other churches. So while, while Timothy's there, a bunch of really, really smart spiritual people come in and they start discrediting the teaching of Paul. And they start trying to tell people a better way or, or a different, more enlightened truth about creation, about spirituality, about God. And so Timothy's this young pastor who, who is, was the disciple or is the disciple of a very prominent figure, but now he's by himself. And all these other people come in and they start talking very, very well and sounding eloquent and they start leading people astray. And so Timothy, I'm sure he feels intimidated and Timothy'd. <laughs> intimidated by that. 
So while Timothy is intimidated by that, this great leader, Paul, who had commissioned him and who had laid hands on him and which was, he ordained him, Paul gets arrested because of his faith in Christ, because of what he was teaching about Jesus, because of his missionary endeavors. Paul gets arrested because of that. So here's Timothy. He's, he's, he's you know, intimidated by these, these, these super spiritual eloquent leaders or people, leaders that have come in to the city of Ephesus, and his mentor is now incarcerated. So is Timothy ashamed of the gospel? Is Timothy ashamed of Paul? This is where he's at. And so Paul writes to him, and he's trying to encourage him, and he's saying, hey, you remember the faith that you had in Jesus Christ? Remember that? So I'm reminding you, you've got you've to, that's, that's like a spark in you, and you've got to fan that into flame. Because listen, Timothy, God did not give you a spirit of being like a coward. Don't be intimidated by all these guys. Don't be ashamed of me in prison. No, no. God has given you a spirit, his spirit. It's a spirit of power. Power to do what? It doesn't matter. It's power. It is raw, divine power of God in you. That is what God has given you. God has given you power. And it's not just power for the sake of power in and of itself. God has given you power that comes with love and self-discipline. Now that word self-discipline, that can be translated in, in many different ways. Some, some of your translations say a sound mind. What self-discipline or a sound mind, it could be translated prudence. What it means is the ability to, to, to control yourself and know the right step forward and take the right step forward. So you don't make rash decisions, you make wise decisions. How can we as Christians make wise decisions? How can we as Christians know what we're supposed to do and do that? By the Spirit of God. By the Spirit of God. So God's Spirit doesn't result in cowardice. No, no, no. It is entirely unremitted power that results in love and self-discipline or a sound mind. So you see, that's what the Spirit of God in us is. That's what, that's what Paul is telling Timothy. Remember that you've got divine supernatural power in you, and it's a power of love. And what kind of love is it? The love that, that, that says, here's a world that is lost and broken, and dying, and so I will send my one and only son to die for that world and to save that world. That's the kind of love that the Spirit of God puts in us. So, Timothy, you don't, we don't have a spirit of cowardice. We don't have a spirit of, of timidity. We don't have a spirit of fear. No, we have a spirit of, we have God's spirit, which is power and love and self-discipline. Now we can go on. Verse 8. So, because we have this, this spirit in us, don't be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. Don't be ashamed to tell people the gospel. And don't be ashamed of me either. Even though I'm in prison, I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. I love this verse because this verse speaks so much to who we are as a church and our core value, passion over being comfortable. See, the, the, that word where he says, suffer with me, that's actually one word in the Greek. And, and what it means is endure bad stuff with me for the sake of the gospel. And that word suffer, it's, it's, we get the same word passion from that word right there, suffer. That's, that's, that's what being passion or, or having passion over being comfortable is all about, is being willing to suffer for the sake of the good news. If we are going to proclaim, if we are going to preach, if we are going to express the gospel to other people, it has to come with suffering. Now, that's a hard thing to say because people hear that and the word suffering, it puts a negative connotation in our minds because, let's face it, we live in a world of suffering. We live in a world where people are suffering because of, oh, oh I don't know, a pandemic. 
a pandemic that is literally a physical illness that is, that is sweeping the entire globe. We live in a world where people are also suffering a spiritual pandemic. For the last few weeks at our church, it's been mentioned and it's even been directly addressed. We've talked about racism at our church because that's, what's, that's the, the, the conversation. That's the zeitgeist of our culture right now. People are talking about it and it is a sin and it is evil and it is causing suffering. So when you say suffer with me for the sake of the gospel, people get wrapped up in that word suffering. And I think what we have to do is you can't just leave it there at the idea of suffering. You have to look at what, what is the result? What is the, the why is suffering there in the text? Paul was incarcerated for telling people about the gospel, but he had such a burden and such a broken heart for people to know the good news about Jesus Christ that he would go to prison for it. He would suffer for it. If we truly believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, then it should demand suffering in our lives. Now, again, there's that word again, suffering. You can't get hung up on it. Why? Why why would the gospel demand suffering in our lives? Does that mean, Christian, that you want us to go, you know, out and, and stand on a soapbox in the middle of the city and start screaming at people that they need Jesus or they're going to burn in hell, turn or burn, be saved or be microwaved? Is that what that means? <laughs> Look, if God tells you to do that, more power to you. You have the Spirit of God in you. Go do it. But I don't think that's what the suffering means. Think about this for a minute. Why did Jesus do what he did? And what exactly did Jesus do? So let's, let me actually, the scripture tells us what Jesus did. Let's go to verse 9 here. This is the good news. Paul said, join with me in suffering for the good news, for the sake of the good news. Here's the good news. God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior, He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. That's the good news. So why does that demand suffering? These two verses right here, they tell us what Jesus did. They tell us Jesus came and he broke the power of death. How in the world did Jesus break the power of death? By dying for us. Now that word for us, what that means is he died in our place. He died as a substitute for us so that if we should believe, if we should receive, if we should accept this good news, then Jesus takes our death, and he shines. That's why it says he illuminated. I love that. He illuminated the way to life and immortality. Now, the, the, it act, the, the Greek there doesn't actually say immortality. It says incorruptibility. To life and incorrupt. It means an incorruptible life. What does, that, what does that mean, incorruptible life? Think about it. What corrupts life more than anything else? Death. So an incorruptible life is an immortal life. But that immortal life was purchased at a very, very high cost for us. And that cost was the Son of God himself, Jesus. So it's good news because it means we can experience an incorruptible life in Jesus Christ. Well, Christian, you still haven't answered the question. If that's the good news, why does that demand suffering? Because you have to look at the other side of that. Without the good news, all we have left is a life of corruption, a life that ends in death. And I would argue, based on Scripture, a life that ends in death eternal, that is hell. If the gospel is real, if the good news of Jesus Christ is real, then that means... Heaven is real and hell is real. And if we have 
the keys, if we have the, 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 the secret, if you will, if we know the good news, then we should look at this world around us and it should break our hearts and cause us to suffer because the good news is that without Jesus Christ, all of us would suffer a corrupted life, a life that would end in death and death eternal. That should break our hearts to the point where we want to join with Paul and with Timothy in suffering. And what does that suffering mean? It means we are so burdened by the good news that we have to share the good news. Why do we have to share the good news? Because we have a mission. It's exactly what Paul's talking about here. It's why he's trying to encourage Timothy. In fact, he continues to talk about this. If we keep rolling through the text, let's go to verse 11 now. God chose me. He chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this good news. And that's why I'm suffering. See, suffering comes with the gospel. And that's why I'm suffering here in prison. But I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of being in prison. I'm not ashamed of my suffering. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why aren't you ashamed, Paul? Because I know the one in whom I trust. You know, I love this. Notice it says, it doesn't say, I know what I trust. I know what I believe. No, it says, I know in whom I believe. I know in whom I trust. I know the one in whom I trust. And I'm sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Now you have to ask the question, okay, so what did Paul entrust to God? What did he give to God to say, God, I need you to take care of this. God, I need you to protect this. God, I need you to nurture this. I'm entrusting this to you. What? Well, he tells us exactly what it is. Now let's go on to verse 13 and 14 and finish out. Hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching that you learned from me. A pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, who lives within us carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. It's right there. What does Paul entrust to God? Well, why is Paul suffering? It's the gospel. See, this is one of those things. Now what he's saying is, well, hold on, Christian. Did Paul give the gospel to Timothy or did Paul give the gospel to God? What are you saying? I'm saying this, that if, if Paul's mission, remember Paul said, I am a preacher and I'm an apostle and I am a teacher of the good news and that is why I'm suffering, but I'm not ashamed of it because I know in whom I have trusted and I know that he's going to take care of what I have entrusted to him. So what is Paul? Paul entrusting to God, it's the same thing that he's entrusting to Timothy. The precious truth. It's the good news. Paul trusts God to take care of his mission, which is the gospel. And he's telling Timothy the same exact thing. You have to take care of this mission. You have to take care of this gospel. You have to take care of this good news. And you've got to see that it's going to be nurtured. It's going to be well taken care of. It's going to be protected. It's going to grow. Well, how can Timothy do it? The same way that God does it. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right here. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully protect, carefully guard the precious truth. It's because of the Holy Spirit that Paul knew the precious truth, the good news could be protected and could be guarded. So I'm going to close with these three simple points that I want us to remember that, that are going to pull us back to this idea that we have a mission. And I want us to understand it. And I want us to know that we have a mission. We have a job to do, people. You know, I'm, I'm standing here in this room and it's a, you know, I know you can see it on your screens, hopefully. It's a big empty room couple weeks, people are going to start coming back. And we're going to try to be responsible, and we're going to uh, not allow the whole room to be filled. One of the things that, that people say to me as, as the pastor, as the leader, is you're supposed to have vision. You're supposed to give the people vision. Okay, let me, let me give you some vision. One of the things that I long to see at our church, I pray for this. This is my secret desire. This is my secret hope. I want to see a day when people come to this church 
And people get baptized at this church because they accepted Jesus Christ. But I want to see the day when it's not me baptizing people. It's because the person sitting right here on the front row in seat 104 had a friend that they started telling about Jesus. And they brought that friend to church and that friend sat right next to him in seat 105. And that friend heard about Jesus from this platform, but it only confirmed everything he had been hearing from seat 104. And it only confirmed everything he had been seeing from the life, from the faith and the love from seat 104. And so C-105 believes in Jesus Christ because of C-104. And C-105 wants to get baptized. And so C-105 says, hey, I believe in Jesus. I want to get baptized. And so C-104 baptizes C-105. That's what I want to see. I want to see the mission of our church, was, which is to reach people far from God so they will experience faith in Christ. I want to see it carried out, not by myself Solely, or the staff solely, or the volunteers solely, or within these walls. I want to see it carried out by the church, which is the people of God who are here and who are out there. I want to see, here's my vision. I want to see people getting baptized by other people in this church because they have a mission. We have a mission. And because of this mission, hear me now, we have the power of God. We have to understand that is how the mission is accomplished. We have the power of God. So I have these three very simple points that these verses are consistently reminding us of. The first one is very, very simple. We have the power of God in the gospel. We have the power of God in the gospel. It's in the, what do you mean that it's in the gospel? Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God. He says the same thing in verses 9 and 10 here. He reminds us that, listen, Jesus Christ came to this world, and when Jesus Christ came to the world, he broke the power of death. And not only did he break the power of death, but he illuminated the way to a life incorruptible, which means an eternal, immortal life. That's the power of God, and it's in the gospel. You have to understand that when you go out there and you tell people about the gospel, it is not on you for that gospel to be successful because the gospel already is successful. Jesus already broke death and showed us life. That's the power of God. So quit thinking that the, the, the success of the gospel is dependent on you. It's not. It's already God's power. Second thing, the power of God in suffering. The power of God in suffering. This is one of the things where I, I think we as a church and me personally, this is one of the things I, I really struggle with this. I don't know if you struggle with this, but I struggle with this. I have neighbors that I know don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and aren't living for him. Okay? And so I, 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 I've, I pray for the opportunities. And sometimes I have the opportunities to minister to those neighbors. And I get scared. Or I might feel ashamed. Why do you feel ashamed? You should never be ashamed of the gospel. That's, that's absolutely right. But why would I feel ashamed? Because I think they're going to think I'm, I'm closed-minded. I think in my mind they're, gonna, they're not going to want to hear this. And sometimes, you know, I, Thoughts about God and theology. Everybody has opinions about God. I think in my mind, you know, I have an opinion on God and they're going to have an opinion on God. And this is one of those things where people just have to say, nobody knows if they're right or not. And so let's just agree to disagree. And so all of those thoughts start running through my mind and they slow me down from sharing the gospel. Okay. But that's me, your pastor. But it doesn't excuse me. It doesn't take away from the fact that I'm supposed to still step into that situation. Even though it's uncomfortable, even though I might be a little scared, and to be honest, I might feel a little ashamed, step into that situation. That uncomfortability, that place of not being comfortable, 
That's where passion is. You step into that suffering. And here's the deal. What these verses teach us is that when we step into that suffering, we experience the power of God. And so when I was preparing this message, I was studying this and I just felt convicted and convicted. And I wrote this down in my notes and it speaks to me and it struck me. I wrote down, I would rather endure suffering by the power of the Holy Spirit than avoid it, than avoid suffering and never experience his power at work. I think one of the reasons that we don't see the mighty hand of God in our own personal lives is we never actually take that step where we need the mighty hand of God at work in our lives. If you want to see God move, if you want to see the power of God, step into the uncomfortable. Step into that place where, well, what what does that mean, step into the uncomfortable? For Paul, it meant that he was going to go to prison. For Timothy, it meant that he was going to stand up to some popular people. If you'll step into that place that is scary, if you'll step into that place that's uncomfortable because of the mission that we all have as believers in Jesus Christ, if you will step into that, I believe the Bible teaches that you will experience the power of God. Well, where does the Bible actually say that? Remember what Paul told Timothy? He said, God didn't give us a power of cowardice, a spirit of cowardice. He gave us a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So if God gives you that power, use it. You know, there's a, a documentary that one of my favorite, and I'm not a documentary guy, one of my favorite documentaries I've ever watched is a documentary. You can go watch it right now. Well, not right now. Let me finish first. Um, called Breaking Two. You should go watch it. It's really good. It's about what these guys do is this, this team of scientists and athletic trainers, they take the world's top marathon athletes and they, they get super scientific with these guys and train these guys because they want to see if it's humanly possible to run a marathon in under two hours, hence the title Breaking Two. And so they, they, you know, they spend months with these guys and training them and analyzing their steps. And they actually design a whole new running shoe that's supposed to return like 2% of the energy back to the runner. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And they, they develop this perfect course. And they, they, they uh, have pace runners that are going to run with them, but nobody can run with these guys for a long time. So they have pace runners that run a short time. They have a, a pace car with a, a line on the ground that shows them where they need to be in order to, to break the, the two-hour barrier. And so the, the day of the race finally comes, and they run the race. And this runner runs a marathon, 26.2 miles, in two hours and 25 seconds. He missed it by 25 seconds. Why am I, what, what does that have to do with anything? He went through all of this training, He did all of this stuff, all this analysis and all of this study and all of this practice, but he still didn't know if he could do it until he actually tried. He didn't know if he had the power to break two until he actually tried. A couple years later, they did the same study again. There's a sequel to the documentary and the guy did it. He broke the two-hour barrier, which is insane. It's so stupid fast. It's pretty much, think of it, it's faster than what most people can sprint for two solid hours. It's, It's amazing. Lots of times, we don't know the power that we have because we aren't willing to step into the suffering. Step into the suffering to experience the power of God. And this brings me to my last one. We've talked about the power of God in the gospel. We've talked about the power of God in suffering. And you have to understand, understand this. In Jesus Christ, we have the power of God in us. You know, I, I read really quickly through this passage, and I feel kind of bad. I probably shouldn't have, but it's right there um, in verses uh, 9 and 10. It says, God has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Did you catch that? Because of his own purpose and grace. God has a a purpose 
for the gospel. And if you're watching right now, and if you've never accepted or believed in Jesus, Jesus died on the cross for a purpose that I think goes beyond just so you can have eternal life. God has a purpose for you. There is an intent behind that. You have a holy, divine purpose in Christ. And you have, and and you, you, here's the great thing. You don't earn that purpose. You don't deserve that purpose. God did it out of his grace, out of his purpose and his grace. God has opened the way to him through the gospel. And when we accept and believe that gospel, Paul teaches in verse 7, in verse 12, in verse 14, that the Holy Spirit, God himself, will live inside you. It's because of God's purpose and grace that we, have, we literally have the power of God in us. So let's do something. If we have the power of God in us, let's step up to the line and see if we can break too. If we have the power of God in us, let's step into the suffering. Let's, let's utilize and get on mission for the gospel of Christ. We have the power of God in us through Jesus. What a shame. What a shame it would be for that man that ran that marathon in under two hours to never step up to the line and run the race to see if he had that power. What a shame. If we have the power of God in us, what a shame it would be to never actually step into the suffering of sharing the gospel in this world and seeing the power of God at work in us. Let us do that. Let us step into the suffering. Let us share the gospel. Let us get on mission so we can experience the reality of the power of God in us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the great truth that is Jesus Christ. He said it himself that he was the way, the truth, and the life. God, if there's a a person watching right now that has never trusted in you, then right now, today could be their moment where they experience the power of God, not just bearing witness to it, but experience it in their hearts. God, I pray that you will help them to open up their heart to you and to pray a very simple prayer, a prayer of surrender and a prayer of life because of what you've done on the cross. A prayer that might go like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Please give me power. Please help me love as you love. Please help me know the next step I should take. Thank you for saving me. And God, for those of us that have prayed a prayer like that, for our church right now, God, as we get closer to regathering, as we still have so much work to do in this community, to minister to the broken, to the hurting, to the lost. God, I pray that you will help every single person to be on mission, to be willing to step into the uncomfortable, to be willing to know the gospel and to know you. And to know your power. And God, I believe we can only know your power when we're faithfully following you. When we're stepping into the uncomfortable. When we're willing to put ourselves out there because of the mission that you have put upon your church. The same mission that is Jesus Christ to seek and to save that which is lost. We have a mission, God. And I pray that you will help us. That you will guide us. That you will convict us. to accomplish that mission, to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. Help us to know that we have your power. Help us to experience your power as we suffer for the sake of the gospel by the power of Christ in us. 
We love you so much, Lord. And it's in Jesus' great and powerful name that we pray together. Amen.